and welcome to The Bookshelf, brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, where we look at books pertinent to the study of contemporary South Asia. I'm John Vauder, a research associate at the Institute. And in this segment, we will be discussing Indus Basin Uninterrupted, a history of territory and politics from Alexander to Nehru. With us, we have its author, Uttam Kumar Sinha. Uttam Kumar Sinha is one of India's leading commentators on transboundary water issues. He heads the non-traditional security center at the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analyses in New Delhi, and is the managing editor of Strategic Analysis, the Institute's flagship journal. He is a recipient of many fellowships, the most recent being a senior fellowship at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. His earlier major works include Riverine Neighborhood, Hydropolitics in South Asia, and Climate Change Narratives, Reading the Arctic. Uttam, welcome to the bookshelf. Thank you, John. Pleasure. So in your preface to Indus Basin Interrupted, um, Uninterrupted, a book which really spans the millennia from the Harappa Mohanjo-Daro civilization all the way to the signing of the Indus Waters Treaty uh, 60 years ago. Um, you quote Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, saying that it's perhaps time to talk of many things. Um, and so to open, I just wanted to ask, why did you feel it was such an opportune time to write this book? Um, and what are the different issues and themes you hope to address by it? Well, thank you, John. Yes, uh, Alice in the Wonderland, uh, that's the line, actually. And that wonderful satire of the Victorian Britain, you know. And as the line goes, uh, the time has come, uh, Walrus says to the carpenter, to talk of many things. And then it goes on saying, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings, you know. So uh, it was an interesting way of opening uh, the book, I thought, because there are so many intertwined uh, aspects of the Indus Basin uh, that needed to be unraveled. Um, you know. Of course, the Indus Basin is, is not a wonderland in that sense. Uh, neither is it a fantasy world. I think it has deep history, uh, intriguing and interconnected history, uh, a hydrology heritage, so to say, uh, a history of, of territory and politics, as the subtitle of the book suggests, a history that, that intricately connects to the reality of today. I think this is in some sense really the sense uh, of the book. I took this exercise as part of my deputation or Sir John to the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library from 2018 to 2020, uh, Team Murthy, uh, as it is called, it was the residence of the first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, and no Prime Minister ever stayed after him. Uh, and it turned out to become a great institution, uh, a great discursive place, uh, you know, a treasure house of books, materials, papers, diaries, etc. cetera. Um, so valuable are the works uh, and the notes and, and, and many of the papers there that many of the important work that has come out recently, for example, the declassified Huxa papers, which uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh brought out, or the VK Krishna Menon papers that again was brought out into a book, you know, become a very uh, useful sort of knowledge in the public domain. And uh, the Nehru Memorial uh, Museum and Library has done a fantastic uh, sort of um, work in bringing in scholars and allowing them to bring out uh, work into the public. I think the timing of the book is also very uh, interesting. I think uh, as I was researching this work, uh, I realized uh, um, it would be six decades of the Indus Waters Treaty, which I guess is an important landmark, uh, something to reflect upon. Uh, six decades of uh, uninterrupted functioning of the treaty, which itself is quite remarkable given the political animosity between India and Pakistan. And, and despite the wars that happened, in 65, 71, and the 1998 Kargil, uh, the treaty continued to function. Uh, and I think there's some part of that in the book itself at the closing end. Also, I think the Indus Treaty over the last five to six years was very politically charged uh, in, in India. Uh, much news because uh, of the 2016 Uri attack 
which again, like the 2008 Mumbai attack and the 2001 parliament attack, you know, brings us this ferocious constituency which calls about for punishing Pakistan and abrogating the treaty. You know. So we were in that period of time when I was doing research on this book, that there was this constituency back again crying loudly uh, you know, after the Pulwama attack in 2019, just before the general election, that uh, we should punish Pakistan uh, war, uh, to, so to speak, by other means. And therefore, abrogating the treaty uh, becomes an important instrument of punishment, I think. And these noises, the, the, the bellicosity, uh, along with the more prevailing, saner voices of optimizing the treaty, uh, rather than breaking away from it, gave me a sort of a research relevance and a push to look back and see how it all came about. And, and looking back is always very interesting these days in India, <laughs> especially if you're looking at Nehru and, and the so many critical decisions uh, that he undertook, like signing of the treaty in 1960. And I wanted to really go deep into the eight years of the negotiating process and capture some of the, the debate in India, uh, as well as uh, look at the wider strategic landscape, how the Americans were looking at, uh, you know, the flashpoints that were emerging between India and Pakistan. What was Russia's or the Soviet Union uh, interest in the region? And these also come out quite uh, well uh, in the book. And, and it, uh, you know, opens up to many of the things probably which we did not know. The, the undercurrents in particular, uh, some of the views uh, of the American uh, leaders when they were looking at South Asia, it was completely new for them, uh, 1947 partition uh, and, and the fading away with the colonial power, um, Britain uh, brought in a certain vacuum which was trying to be filled by Russia and the US. So there's a lot of interesting aspects that uh, covers that period and comes out through, again, lots of notes, diaries, uh, and many archival uh, materials here. I think when I started doing the book, I kept going back and back. And so uh, I went to the partition process 1947 and, and discovered the role of Indian civil Indians, uh, which I think is much overlooked uh, in our partition work uh, and their uh, alertness and, and diligence in realizing the strategic significance of the Firozpur headworks of the Satluj, well, you know, that it should be uh, in the hands of the Indians. Uh, and this led to some very interesting interventions at the highest level with Mount Patton and, and Nehru. And, and we realized that the Ratcliffe line, um, you know, was shifted in favorably of India a few kilometers west. And I think there's a, a lot of account of that uh, in the book, which actually is quite fascinating. And when we're going to come to 75 years of India's independence, we're going to look into the partition. Uh, there's going to be a lot of research activities and scholarly work. And I think um, uh, much of the, the material that I have excavated uh, looking at civil engineers will probably be some new knowledge of that period, I think. Um, I think doing a book like this uh, is both beautiful and, and terribly rigorous. Uh, and I don't think any good researcher will mind uh, the rigor part of it. But uh, uh, yes, there is, um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, the problem of plenty of information. What do you do with so much of information that comes to you? Uh, how much do you filter out? What do you keep? What do you, you know, remove? You know? And, and the point of this book is that you keep going back, as I said, from the partition to the colonial period, to the Mughal, uh, and then eventually uh, you reach the Indus civilization. And, and that's from where it all begins. Really. Uh, and it's like rewinding a tape and then playing it. You know? And interestingly, 2021, again, talking about timing of the book, uh, I realized that it is going to be 100 years of the discovery of the sites at Harappa in West Punjab and Mohenjadaro in Sindh. So that again is a very uh, interesting timing to the books. And, you know, the findings the sites which were discovered but gave India a new cultural heritage uh, that did not start from Alexander of Macedonia's invasion. You know. So the discovery, in a sense, completely changes the chronology of ancient India. Uh, and, and I described this in, in the very beginning, 
uh, as the aging of India's history. Uh, it actually pushes back India's timeline to almost 3,000 years uh, before Alexander came into India. And what really emerges is what we all know so well about the Indus civilization, the cradle of civilization, a river civilization in many sense, is their highly developed culture, you know, their organized economy based on agriculture and trade. And most significantly, I think, and what is linked to uh, the book thereon is, is the aspect of irrigation, which is so central uh, to agriculture and food production. And, and when we look at the world today, when we look at the region South Asia in terms of uh, the food water connect or the nexus, it, it gives us that kind of connected knowledge uh, to the Indus civilization. And this for me, in the context of the book was far, far more important than, than the discovery, uh, you know, the sites being discovered as being a, a kind of a cultural, historical, intellectual challenge to the British colonial supremacy. Of course it was, but for me, I think, it was the knowledge of water management, uh, the ability to irrigate, uh, the channels of water that flowed into the land was critically important as I examined the water situation uh, in the present context. I frankly do not really claim to uh, have written something completely unknown. Uh, my contribution has been really to unearth more facts and information and, and present it in an easy, readable way uh, or, or what is called effective uh, communication. And in the process, I think the book uh, tends to be very uh, less pedantic and, and tries to package information interestingly. Uh, and I would like to underline that the book does not in any sense interpret history. It, it only narrates it through historical uh, characters. I also found a lot of dramatic encounters on the Indus Basin almost like the two sovereigns today, India and Pakistan, facing each other uh, across the Indus divide. And the incident we all know is Alexander Porus on the Hydaspus, you know, and, and I describe at some length about, uh, you know, face-to-face -face meeting of Alexander and Porus uh, divided by uh, the, the swell of the river, uh, uh, the Jhelum or the Hydaspus as it's called. Then there's this interesting encounter of Kazim, the first Muslim invader to India, uh, encountering the Hindu king, Dahar. And, uh, you know, Dahar, when he looks at Kazim forces, uh, suggests that, you know, the river will take care of the Muslim invader, that the river is, is powerful enough to stop the forces of Kazim. Of course, Kazim did cross the river and eventually became the first Muslim invader to India. And there are likewise sort of, uh, you know, these dramatic encounters. Uh, for example, Chengiz Khan and Jalaluddin Khwazrazuman from uh, Samarkand in the Battle of Indus 2012 near now Sera. And, and the battle strategies that Chengiz Khan works out in terms of encircling tactics, tactics based on, on the enemy's strength and using the river uh, in the background. Is, is quite uh, uh, fantastic if you look at how uh, military approaches with the rivers uh, were, were formed. Yeah, I had uh, definitely found some of these very kind of uh, ancient and medieval accounts of you know how the river was forged, the military tactics, the, the successive invasions, and also irrigation infrastructures to be very fascinating. And I found that um, this very broad historical context kind of gave a different uh, perception and view of the Indus River Valley and how we think about the Indus Waters Treaty uh, than maybe we, we might have otherwise. Um, and you had, you had spoken in your preface, reflecting on the writing of the book, um, how you, know, you wanted to open the pages of history to interlink the events of the basin, um, but also it was an attempt to kind of to identify with the different historical figures who were there. Um, and like you said, it was very interesting to see Alexander kind of speculate that maybe the Indus runs into the Nile because he saw, you know, crocodiles um, mm -hmm. at that time. So is there, I mean, in terms of the, the structuring of the book, um, does this long view of history, especially when we think about the Indus Waters Treaty today, 
um, allow you to share certain uh, insights with the reader that maybe would have been more difficult, you know, had you limited your scope only to the, say, negotiations over the Indus Waters Treaty, you know, during the time of Nehru, or events that have happened afterward um, in the bellicosity between India and Pakistan? Yeah, well, as I said, I think uh, there is this great uh, connection um, uh, because the Indus has a huge history uh, behind it and, and is quite, events are quite interconnected and I have actually captured those events till uh, the Indus Treaty is signed in 1960, which I describe as a, as a hydrological pause because I think it is for the first time that, um, you know, two sovereigns uh, divide the basin in, in terms of volume sharing. And of course, there's 60 years of history after that, which uh, will require me to attempt another book and find out how the treaty itself has functioned. But to be honest, I think, I mean, I've been very, um, in, you know, sort of impressed by the whole uh, historical uh, sort of way of looking at rivers. You know, all rivers have a certain history behind it. You know, and it's a long history, uh, you know, in a sense. It, it could be the Nile, it could be the Mesopotamia, it could be the Yellow River in China. I think all rivers carry history uh, with them. And I, in a sense, wanted to indulge in that history. Um, and as you rightly say, you know, to capture Indus Basin as, as a powerful symbol uh, of the passage of time and how it, in a way, influenced the socio-political landscape, the, the institutional structures, uh, the technological interventions, uh, the legal framing in terms of the water disputes that happened between Punjab and Sindh. And I think most importantly, uh, from, from a transboundary perspective, the potential for commerce and peace and how to resolve uh, dispute and conflict. And all these are seen through the history of the Indus. And these collected together to form the treaty in 1960. And all these are significantly important even today in terms of the institutional structure of the treaty itself, whether it is still very useful in the current political context of India and Pakistan. The issues of technological interventions, the way in which we are going to build our water projects on the Western rivers in Kashmir. The legal framing, is, is the treaty uh, legally powerful enough uh, to, to sort of engage with the various concerns that Pakistan has vis-a-vis -vis India? I think these are perspectives which happen through a certain historical timeline, which are also very significant uh, today. I think these dimensions continue in some sense to influence the basin um, in, in the 21st century. So I think there is this powerful interconnectedness of history uh, to the Indus and its tributaries, which I think I have got to know while doing this book. And, and it's a very powerful uh, interconnect, uh, interconnection, I think. Uh, as I kept moving back in history, you know, you almost feel like a historian and I'm not a historian. I'm a political scientist, but I enjoyed being a scholar as you kept moving back in history. Uh, and they emerged what I think was the continuity in terms of knowledge on water management. Uh, the Harappans, you know, harnessed the flood inundation most effectively. Uh, they did dry farming, uh, you know, in arid plains. Uh, Methods like storing rainwater and then channelizing it for irrigation was also very extensively applied. I think these evidences, that knowledge, uh, the way they manage the rivers and the waters is, I think, uh, critically important and significant even today uh, in the Indus spaces. So I describe this uh, knowledge as, as instructive continuity. Uh, and what we see in Punjab many, many centuries later uh, it became the largest irrigation system in the world. And um, it, it sort of brought facts that the Indus Basin also, while it is extremely productive, and we see that in history, it is also equally very unpredictable with, with frequent changes in the course of the rivers and the variation in flow. Uh, we see that quite a lot, and I've captured those hydrological changes of the Indus uh, through uh, its history. And these, again, uh, become very significant when you look at the Indus Basin as a whole, when we see the <coughs> hydrological <coughs> changes that are happening and how the two countries need to adjust to those 
uh, hydrological changes. Uh, this whole idea about plumbing the Indus started right from the Indus civilization. And even today, if you look at South Asia in particular, uh, it's a region where great plumbing exercises are going on in terms of linking rivers, in terms of building storages, uh, in terms of diverting the water from one end to another. So I think it's so one plumbing continuity uh, that happens on the rivers in, in South Asia, which is really defined by the Indus Basin itself, I think. I'd also like to say that, you know, when it comes to history, uh, it's, it's all history, I think, is contemporary history. You know, as, as the Italian philosopher Benedetto Croce said, you know, and I strongly believe that even as a political scientist, uh, you know, it's important to explore those, the contemporariness of history, uh, especially when it comes to the rivers, uh, and especially when they are transboundary, as it is today. Uh, transboundary rivers require, you know, complex judgments and, and policy interventions. And therefore, we cannot be historically ignorant. And, and therefore, uh, further, we have to look at the past uh, through the eyes of the present. And, and the Indus Basin is, is typical of this. I think the beauty of history in some sense is that it helps one to discern what the story is. And, and there's a whole lot of story on the Indus. And I wanted to get the story out, not just merely what the problem is, but by determining you know, the who, the what, the when, the where, the how, and the why of a narrative. And I think you'll find in the book that you know, characters run along the timeline of the Indus right till the Indus Water Treaty in 1960. And there's a whole lot of characters that I bring in uh, that are influenced, I think, by concerns of pride, power, envy, fear, desperation, and many a times sheer greed uh, and their actions uh, and consequences uh, have been quite uh, momentous uh, on the Indus itself. And I think it's um, definitely a testament both to your scholarship ability and the writing that you're able to uh, draw out these continuities, um, you know, for the reader to recognize. Um, you had talked about some of the various uh, technological interventions, beginning with uh, Harappa Mohanjo Daro and then leading through um, the successive civilizations that built along its banks. Um, what was very fascinating to me is how, you know, it's not only the technological, but like you said, it intervenes in many uh, socio-political scapes. And so actually water development becomes inherently tied up with the idea of uh, prosperity and political legitimacy. And you had said how it's very necessary to understand this past and how it weighs on the present. So I'm just curious um, to kind of bring the conversation towards some, you know, current events around us. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a meeting of the permanent Indus Commission uh, between India and Pakistan. Um, right now, there are also there's a farmers crisis um, in Punjab, which has also been, you know, a source of uh, a tumult at different times in history. Um, and we also have uh, the neighborhood first policy for India um, and things like hydroelectric projects and dams are very important today in terms of um, establishing connectivity. And like you said, in terms of you know, the broader strategy of being able to establish um, influence. So I'm, I'm curious um, how you see this concept of water and political legitimacy uh, playing into um, the unfolding of uh, politics in South Asia today. Yeah, right. I mean, that's very well framed, John. Water uh, being tied to the idea of political legitimacy. I think it is uh, uh, quite clear that, uh, and again, the history on the Indus Basin has shown that uh, you know, political legitimacy is you know, tied to uh, water planning, um, water development, um, you know, as part of good governance and a certain degree of moral responsibility, you know, as you put it. Um, the ninth century Hindu ruler, Avanti Varman uh, in Kashmir, and he was called the engineer king, interestingly. He harnessed the bountiful water resources of the kingdom to bring peace and prosperity. I think the attention to flood management and irrigation was therefore very critical uh, to maintaining social order and therefore linked to political legitimacy. We see that during the medieval period as well, the Tughlaq dynasty in particular, uh, we see a lot of attention to uh, the farmers in particular, encouraging them to build their own wells, uh, employ water harvesting systems, you know, bring in uh, two harvests, the kharif and the rabi crop, instead of 
one cultivation. Uh, there were these great initiation that uh, the rulers undertook uh, and it brought them great political stability and political legitimacy. Uh, I remember, I think uh, I account this in the book that Muhammad bin Tughlaq was probably the first ruler to have established a very separate department of agriculture, the Diwane Kohi, as it was called. And he surveyed extensively the, the cultural lands from time to time and, and gave special schemes, loans, you know, what we look at the farmers today in Punjab and think about incentives and subsidies for farmers. I think we thought about those schemes then, uh, loans to farmers to improve cultivation uh, in the Punjab and in the Ganga, Jamna, Dwabs. Uh, Firoz Shah Tughlaq established a network of canals, which then the British uh, took that knowledge and expanded uh, further, I think. They, so uh, it's quite clear that uh, political legitimacy, political stability, um, the rule that which was seen to be benevolent uh, came a lot about good governance on, on the rivers itself. Um, and today, uh, when we come to the present day context in South Asia, particularly India, and its neighborhood, we see, we see that, uh, you know, the rivers play a very important part of that diplomacy. In my earlier book, I have titled it The Riverine Neighborhood, uh, simply because I, I think the neighborhood, the South Asian neighborhood is, is far more riverine-like than any other physical attribute. Uh, it, 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 it sort of gives an impression of a geographic um, perspective uh, and it connects states through the rivers. Um, of course, there are political boundaries that the rivers crosses, but it introduces uh, a certain degree of uh, interdependencies uh, that can either reinforce or, or reduce differences amongst the states. Um, if one talks about the riverine neighborhood, uh, one cannot totally remove hydropolitics around it, but one can, uh, emphasize on hydro cooperation. And I think that is the new way forward in South Asia. Uh, I think um, the argument around sharing the benefits of the rivers uh, is critically important today in the first neighborhood uh, diplomacy of India in particular. Uh, the 60 years time, we have resolved the, the sharing of the river waters in terms of volume. I think the next phase is more towards sharing the benefits of, of uh, the rivers uh, and the current government's uh, neighborhood first uh, uh, is greatly about using the rivers in the region, in the region as, a, as a positive uh, connector uh, and, and brings in a whole network of uh, environment, economic and security uh, interdependency. Uh, hard politics and there is no uh, dearth of uh, hard politics in South Asia. Uh, we'll always say that, you know, uh, rivers belong to to a certain country. Uh, and therefore, the first interest is of the country from where the rivers passes through. But, but rivers also flow, and, and many a times it crosses the political boundaries. And therefore, it is not of, uh, of exclusivity, but of, of mobility and, and plurality of what can be described as, as a living complex a system. So cooperation on water, very simply put, is, is a subset of a larger diplomacy in the region. Um, the transboundary rivers therefore have to be approached uh, from, a, from a more comprehensive perspective rather than a statist understanding. Uh, and the good way to do it is to know the history of the rivers very well. Mm. And you, in your, in your postscript, mention some of the ecological challenges um, that are beginning to face uh, the Indus uh, River Basin and also South Asia. Um, concerning water sustainability, uh, food, energy. Um, and uh, much of this also, you know, impinges on, uh, you know, also the, the Indus Waters Treaty. And you had um, mentioned that possibly, uh, you know, a, a reordering, um, you know, might be needed. And you, you know, had in your answer just now, I kind of touched upon that, talking about how, you know, in the way that we imagine uh, water sharing, you know, it may require um, either going beyond some of the frameworks that we've used in the past um, or looking at things in a more kind of comprehensive way. So now that we're kind of coming toward the end of the segment and looking toward the future, um, you know, for this, you know, water sharing relationship between India and Pakistan in particular, 
Um, are there uh, any ways in which you think some of uh, the treaty could be looked at afresh? Um, and also just uh, having gone through, you know, uh, this plentiful information in, the, in this uh, river system, uh, what did you enjoy most? What was the most surprising to you and pleasurable um, while, while researching this book? Well, there were lots of many uh, events in the book that uh, amused me, that actually um, um, surprised me on, on many occasions. Um, but I'll come to that. Uh, you know, the treaty when it was signed in 1960, envisaged the most complete utilization of the Indus system of rivers. It was a system of rivers, the Indus and the many other tributaries that joined it. Um, it was of great benefit, I think, uh, um, to both Pakistan and India. And I think that was truly the intention uh, of the treaty. Had it not been for the treaty, I don't see any possibility that Pakistan would have um, built its grand hydraulic works um, at considerable cost to transfer water from the Western rivers uh, to meet its um, you know, irrigation uses and, and become independent of the Eastern rivers, which went to India. And without the Eastern rivers, um, which was given exclusively to India, uh, India would have struggled to operationalize the Bhakra and Nangal dams, which were critically important for uh, the development of the fields in Punjab. Uh, the treaty, let's not make too much of it. It had limited objectives and, and it fulfilled that objective. 60 years hence, um, uh, the treaty has to be seen uh, in a certain new light. Uh, things have changed. The hydrology has changed. The socioeconomic context has changed. Uh, there's been some dramatic impact of climate change on the flow of the rivers. So it does require rethinking, a relook possibly at the treaty itself. Um, the treaty is not um, the end all of all the problems on the Indus Basin. As I said, the treaty had a limited purpose during the time, which it very nicely uh, fulfilled, uh, thanks to the civil engineers who worked hard in, in determining the volume of, of the water. Um, you can probably describe uh, the treaty uh, as uh, a classical lesson in international mediation. Uh, that's how best you can uh, look at the treaty. Um, but we are at a time where really we need to uh, think about uh, whether this treaty has any further lasting value. Uh, it also would require that uh, we look at the basin from a certain different perspective. I know that the state is supreme, uh, uh, India and Pakistan, um, we have to therefore come to a point of treating the basin as a wholesome value. And therefore the whole idea of joint basin management approaches is something that needs to be considered. I know the politics is not right between India and Pakistan, uh, but um, purely from an hydrological perspective, purely from thinking and, and bringing in a certain degree of knowledge, new knowledge on the basin, it's time to think in certain different ways. Um, I think the treaty in some sense, um, you know, uh, responded well in the 60 years because India played its role very well. And the sense of responsibility that India displayed uh, in the treaty is quite remarkable. Uh, there's been, you know, in retrospect, we talk about India giving away a lot of water to Pakistan. Uh, we often say that uh, Nehru was foolhardy in his generosity. Uh, but I think if you look overall uh, in the entire context of things, uh, the partition, uh, the difficult times of negotiation, uh, India's own requirement in Punjab, I think overall uh, the treaty was something which was needed for both the party. I think uh, uh, it also has remarkably, the treaty is very modern in its, in its, in its approach. It, it also has what is called you know, uh, dispute and differences resolution mechanism. It, it knew very well that uh, while the treaty exists, a dispute too will come about. And there is a mechanism that resolves these disputes through Indus commissioners coming and meeting. So in that sense, it knew very well that uh, Rivers does create disputes, if not, you know, conflict and war. There are parts of the treaty, especially when it comes to water projects, that differences will arise 
um, technically in terms of the technical evaluations of these projects. And, um, also, I think uh, um, we cannot really, from an Indian perspective, we cannot really think about another treaty so long as India does not fulfill the provisions of the treaty. And I think it's uh, done itself great harm by not uh, fulfilling the provisions on, on the Western rivers. Um, remember, uh, India is allowed to develop the Western rivers with a certain storage capacity, uh, 3.6 million acre feet of water it can store. And I know the current government uh, is um, you know, very earnestly following uh, the projects on the Western rivers that it is entitled to. And I think that is quite important to, uh, at this stage for India is uh, to really fulfill the provisions of the treaty and not constantly think about abrogating the treaty. I think abrogation is pointless without not having fulfilled what the provisions are uh, for you. Uh, so in the immediate run, I think uh, uh, the treaty will move on. Uh, there will be um, ideas coming in, but the political climate has to become better for those ideas to be discussed. And the platform to discuss those ideas are the Indus Commissioners meeting that they have regularly every year, at least once a year. And they've done that for the last 60 years. Only last month, they met for the 116th time, which shows uh, how remarkable this treaty is, that despite all the political difficulties, the Indus Commissioners still continue uh, to meet and discuss. And I think this is a platform where uh, uh, new ideas can be brought in uh, as what I described, reordering of the whole basin, uh, issues of food and energy, uh, you know, more socioeconomic uh, assessment of the basin in terms of consumption of water, in terms of, you know, the societal needs, also more assessment on, on uh, you know, the climate trends, uh, especially the melting of the glaciers and the runoffs. But these are still very inconclusive. The science is still not very exact. I think we need to bring in all that into our uh, discussions uh, on the Indus Basin. I think what I liked uh, most uh, uh, in, in the book, and that's the final part of, of your question, is uh, a lot of many things, I think, uh, which were quite interesting for me. Uh, I liked, uh, for example, um, uh, the second part, which I described as uh, uh, diplomacy and commerce on the Indus. I think there's, there are many revolutions that's quite striking on how the British looked at the Indus initially. They treated it as a panic zone. Uh, Lord Minto had three wise men, uh, John Malcolm, Mount Stewart, Elphiston, and Metcalfe, John Metcalfe. And they dealt with the complexities of diplomacy in lands that the British were you know, barely familiar with, you know, Persia, Afghanistan, and Punjab. And their entire objective was to forge alliances. They had this you know, diplomatic caravans that traveled through the Indus terrain in the monsoon period, and in, in, the, in the furious blast of, of the Western deserts. And, and while they were doing this great diplomatic exercises, they were also collecting a lot of geographic detail, you know, intelligence gathering and observing the, the social hierarchy. And, and I think the British gained considerable knowledge on the Indus and on the rivers. They started drawing, the cartographers started drawing these rivers and some of the early um, um, uh, maps of the Indus is in the 80s, 40s and 45. And I have those two maps uh, in the book. Uh, so, you know, there's this whole knowledge being generated by the Britishers that helped them later on when they expanded the canals uh, in Punjab. And also the way they looked at diplomacy westward uh, from the Indus. But I think... Uh, the, the most fascinating aspect for me was how Nehru, um, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru, prevailed over the debate in Parliament, which was largely questioning the treaty at that time. You know, uh, even the mainstream newspaper, and I went through a lot of mainstream newspaper at that time, had really castigated uh, the Indian government for giving in to Pakistan, making concessions after concessions, as the editorial wrote, and a number of. Uh, Parliamentarians were of the view that, you know, India had conceded uh, too much water uh, to Pakistan uh, during the course of the negotiation. In fact, a lot of people actually said that, you know, if India had conceded to the water requirements of Pakistan in 1948, after the partition, as a human consideration, the treaty would not have possibly been required. 
and, and would have possibly saved uh, India many uh, blushes. But I think all this comes out very well. And I, and I capture that debate, the Lok Sabha debate, um, uh, uh, through, through the parliamentary debates that I gathered from the archives. Um, Atal Vihari Vajpayee is a new entrant um, into the Lok Sabha. And uh, Nehru had often described him, seeing him so charged and so articulate uh, in the parliament that he had told him that one day he would become the prime minister, which he did eventually. And I think there is this debate between uh, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee and Nehru on, on the treaty itself. Uh, so these are some very interesting uh, accounts. And, and, and the debate is very passionate uh, over the treaty itself. And, and Nehru was often questioned, uh, lots of uncomfortable questions to him were put forward, uh, you know, on, on the unfairness of the treaty on the cost of the replacement of the canal works and, and the overall India-Pakistan relationship. And, and repeatedly he was drilled in the house. Uh, and yet, eventually, uh, in his own uh, uh, articulation, his articulate style, and in his own worldview, I think, he, he overcame all that. I think uh, it was something uh, very interesting. Um, you know, despite, despite, and this is something about Nehru, the man himself, uh, which in some sense comes out, you know, despite, despite the opinion, uh, which was not too favorable towards the treaty, you know, Nehru stuck to his very distinctly different take. He would, he would often say in the light of his foreign policy approach uh, to not miss the larger picture, you know. And, and having signed the treaty, he emphasized, and I capture a few statements in the book, that it is the context uh, that, that we have to consider uh, and not a particular bit. And I think in the political environment of the 1950s, Nehru was not really averse to reaching out for peace and tranquility. Uh, these were, to him, uh, requisites he felt for stability and development that India desired. Uh, it was not that Nehru was completely blinded by reconciliation towards Pakistan. Uh, and I account this in 1959 when Ayub Khan advocated a common defense in which both India and Pakistan um, would welcome to idea. Even General Thimaya had welcomed this idea of a common defense. It was Nehru who, who cold-shouldered it by, remember, famously retorting defense against whom? because he was not very confident of, of Pakistan. But in the case of the Indus Treaty, however, he felt uh, from time to time uh, that it was a price worth paying. And, and he had actually uh, expressed his disappointment uh, you know, very candidly in his response in the debate in the House uh, for having treated uh, the whole treaty in a very narrow-minded spirit, he said. And, and, and he often would uh, you know, praise the engineers who probably thought of India's interest far more than the parliamentarians did. So I think that for me was, was a very interesting of account. Nehru the man, um, Nehru uh, the prime minister, Nehru the politician um, in the Lok Sabha, and how he sort of in his own internationalist mindset uh, overcame this very negative impression of the treaty and eventually signed the treaty in Karachi on September 19th, 1960. And that visit to Karachi was his last visit to Pakistan. And I think very similar to the, the debates, the question of narrow-minded perspectives versus seeing the wider context. Your book is definitely something that provides to readers, you know, a much wider context um, through time and the political considerations. We'd like to thank you so much uh, for joining us at The Bookshelf. Um, would you be able to lift up the book for our readers so they get a chance to possibly yes. buy the book? I, will. I think uh, this is now, uh, the publishers tell me that it's now uh, in Singapore, available through Amazon. Uh, and there could be a possibility that it's in the bookstores in, in the Singapore streets. So uh, do go and grab a copy. It's not terribly expensive, I must say. I think. Uh, uh, but uh, I would think it's, it's, it's a worthy read, uh, if not for anything else, in terms of a lot of information gathered. I, I would definitely second that it's a worthy read, and we're so grateful to 
have you with us here at the Institute of South Asian Studies to share your perspectives and knowledge. We hope to be able to speak with you again. Um, for our listeners out there, if you wish to learn more about the Institute of South Asian Studies and its work, uh, please visit us at isas, um, isas.nus.edu.sg. Thanks, Dr. Sinha, again for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you all.